The Senate will come to order. Senator Murphy. Good morning, Mr. President. I impose the call of the Senate. The Senate is now under call. Senator Murphy. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I move that further proceedings under the roll call be dispensed with and that the Sergeant at Arms be instructed to bring in the absent members. On that motion, all in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Members, please stand. In our wonderful tradition, today's chaplain is Pastor David Sorn from the Renovation Church in Blaine. And members, needless to say, following today's uh, prayer, please remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. All right, good morning. Uh, we're going to pray in a second. Let me just say thank you uh, for your hard work and leadership and service in our state. It means a lot. Uh, let me pray. Uh, God, I pray today as our laws are discussed that you give generously of your wisdom. Uh, may we lean not on our own understanding but on truth that you have set before us, a higher truth. God, give us the strength to do the right thing, even when the right thing is hard, even when the right thing is not popular. God, increase our desire to do your will, not our own. And God, we thank you for your mercy, for your forgiveness, and even when we fall short, that you have grace. And I ask that you be with these senators now as they seek to lead and legislate with justice and wisdom and truth. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States. Thank you, members. The secretary will take the roll. Abler, Anderson, Barr, Bolden, Carlson, Champion, Coleman, Swadzinski, Dames, Dibble, Dornick, Dreheim, Draskowski, Duckworth, Diedzik, Eichhorn, Farnsworth, Fateh, Frentz, Green, Grunhagen, Gustafson, Hoschild, Herr, Hoffman, Housley, Howe, Jasinski, Johnson, Klein, Koran, Kroon, Kunish, Kupek, Lang, Latz, Liskey, Limmer, Lucero, Mann, Marty, Matthews, May Quaid, McEwen, Miller, Mitchell, Mohammed, Morrison, Murphy, Nelson, Umover, Baton, Pappas, Pa, Port, Pratt, Putnam, Rarick, Rasmussen, Rest, Seeberger, Utke, Weber, Wiesenberg, Westland, Westrom, Wickland, Zhang. Members, a quorum is present. The following members intend to vote from a remote location under Rule 40.7, Senator Desick, Liskey, and Senator Port. Members, if you're interested in following along with me, I am reading from today's Senate agenda, today dated Thursday, March 21st, 2024. We, we will begin at the second order of business, executive and official communications. The following communications were received and referred as indicated. Members will proceed to the third order of business. Messages from the House. The Secretary will read the messages. Mr. President, I have the honor to announce the adoption by the House of the following Senate concurrent resolution herewith returned. Senate concurrent resolution number eight. The Senate concurrent resolution adopting deadlines for the 2024 regular session. Signed, Patrick D. Murphy, Chief Clerk, House of Representatives. Mr. President, I have the honor to announce the adoption by the House of the following Senate concurrent resolution herewith returned. Senate concurrent resolution number nine. A Senate concurrent resolution relating to adjournment for more than three days. Signed, Patrick D. Murphy, Chief Clerk, House of Representatives. Members, members remember, no action is required. We will now proceed to the fifth order of business, rules of committees. Senator Murphy for a motion to adopt the committee reports. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I move the committee reports printed in the agenda 
and the addendum be adopted. On that motion, all in favor say aye. All opposed say no. The motion prevails. Members will now proceed to the sixth order of business, second reading of Senate bills. The secretary will read the Senate file numbers. Senate file numbers 4804, 3204, 439, 4006, 4120, 4384, 4753, 3328, 3438, and 4625. The Senate files have been given their second reading. Members will now proceed to the seventh order of business. The secretary will read the House file numbers. House file numbers 3613 and 3769. The House files have been given their second reading. Members will now proceed to the eighth order of business, which is motions and resolutions. Members, the I'm sorry, and discuss. I'm sorry. Introduction of motions, excuse me, introductions and first reading of Senate bills. I, I put those two things together there. Uh, the bills listed on today's introduction calendar are given their first reading and referred as indicated. Members, if you would like to see the changes, you will proceed to page number two and you'll see Senate file number 5145. That bill has been referred to the Committee on Transportation. Members, as I mentioned, the bills listed on today's introduction calendar are given their first reading and referred as indicated. <laughs> Members, now we will proceed to the ninth order of business, which is the motions and resolutions. We will adopt the author's motion as one motion. All in favor say aye. All opposed say no. The motion prevails. I will now call on individual senators for motions. We will begin with Senator Bowden. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that Senate File 3809 be withdrawn from the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety and be re-referred to the Committee on Human Services. This is my bill, and Mr. Ch uh, President, both chairs are uh, in agreement. Thank you, Senator Bowden. Senator Bowden moves that Senate File Number 3809 be withdrawn from the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety and re-referred to the Committee on Human Services. On that motion, all in favor say aye. All those who oppose say no. The motion prevails. Senator Kunish. Thank you, Mr. Ch uh, Mr. President. Um, I move that Senate File 4250 be withdrawn from the Committee on Education Finance and be re-referred to Environment, Climate, and Legacy. Uh, I have spoken with the authors, and everyone is in agreement. Thank you, Senator Kunis. Senator Kunis moves that Senate file number 4250 be withdrawn from the Committee on Education Finance and be re-referred to the Committee on Environment, Climate, and Legacy. On that motion, all in favor say aye. All opposed say no. The motion prevails. Representative, excuse me, Senator Young. Uh, Mr. President, um, I move that Senate File 4593 be withdrawn from the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety and be referred to the Committee on Labor. Senator Zhang, did you talk to both yes. chairs? Yes and yes. Yes and yes. Yeah. Thank you, Senator Zhang. Senator Zhang moves that Senate File number 4593 be withdrawn from the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety and referred to the Committee on Labor. On that motion, all in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Senator Seberger. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that Senate file number 4826 be withdrawn from the Committee on Transportation and re-referred to the Committee on Agriculture, Broadband, and Rural Development. This is my bill, and the chairs agree. Thank you, Senator Seberger. Senator Seberger moves that Senate file number 4826 be withdrawn from the Committee on Transportation and referred to the Committee on Agriculture, Broadband, and Rural Development. On that motion, all in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Senator McEwen. Thank you, Mr. President. 
I move that the appointments withdrawn from the Committee on Labor and placed on the confirmation calendar under Senate Rule 8.2, reported in the journal for March 20th, 2024, be returned to the committee from which they were withdrawn. These are appointments for the Board of High Pressure Piping Systems, and the names are Aubrey Archer, Kyle Bain, Nirmal Jain, Mark Kind, Mark, excuse me, Mark Kinks, and Jake Pettit. Thank you. Any, any discussion? Seeing none, Senator uh, McEwen moved that the, appointments with, uh, that the appointments withdrawn from the Committee on Labor and placed on the co confirmation calendar under Senate Rule 8.2 reported in the journal for March 20th, 2024 be returned to the committee from which they were withdrawn. All in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Senator Coleman. Thank you, Mr. President. Pursuant to Rule 5.1, I move that Senate File 733 be withdrawn from the Committee on Finance, given a second reading, and placed on general orders, and I am the chief author of this bill. Thank you, Senator Coleman. Pursuant to Rule 5.1, Senator Coleman, chief author, moves that Senate File Number 733 be withdrawn from the Committee on Finance and given a second reading and placed on general orders. Any discussion? Senator Marty. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Senator Coleman, this is a bill that does have some financial implications, and I think we just got a hearing request a couple of days ago. Um, but I think we have a good policy here of checking out all the financial implications of bills in the Senate Finance Committee. And I was thinking if you wanted to move it somewhere, you would have chosen to move it instead to the Judiciary Committee, where I understand I think Senator Latz is having a hearing on a number of gun violence prevention bills, including straw purchasing and so on. And so I would urge you to send it there instead. And I will object to this decision and ask for members to vote no and ask for a roll call. If you give me just one second, I'm just making sure that we get this right. Members, I was, I was just confirming to make sure that I was accurate, is that in order for this motion to go forward and to prevail, we have to have 34 members in order to do so. After the deadline, after Tuesday, just so individuals will know, it will be 41 votes then. Um, with that being said, I, I did see uh, Senator Latz, and then I'll come to you again, uh, Senator Coleman. Uh, thank you, Mr. President and Senator Coleman. I appreciate uh, the sense of, uh, of, of urgency and the desire to move a bill like this forward. Um, and uh, I, I'm supportive of the, the policy behind it. In fact, the Judiciary Committee passed it um, over a year ago, um, January of 2023. Uh, I'm sorry, March, uh, actually almost exactly a year ago, March 23rd, 2023. Um, since that time, of course, uh, there have been some uh, public incidents uh, and there has uh, also been a fiscal uh, evaluation on this. So I think um, because the Judiciary Committee is going to be hearing a number of gun violence prevention bills tomorrow, uh, this topic would fit in well with um, our uh, committee hearing and I think it is more appropriate for this to be returned to the Judiciary Committee for that purpose. Uh, so uh, I would oppose the motion to bring this to the floor, but if Senator Coleman uh, wanted to uh, revise the motion to uh, return it to the Judiciary Committee, um, I would support that motion, um, and uh, I suspect Senator Marty might also uh, support that motion as well. Senator Coleman, to your motion. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, to clarify a few things, my bill has been through Judiciary Committee. It passed out of Judiciary Committee with unanimous bipartisan support. Mr. President, I did send a hearing request in for finance because I've been waiting over a year to get this bill heard out of finance. Mr. President, I would like to speak to the urgency of my motion because doing this, I do not do so lightly. Mr. President, Paul Elmstrand, my constituent, is dead. Matthew Ruge is dead. Firefighter Adam Finseth is dead. Mr. President, this motion is urgent because these brave heroes were killed with a weapon that was an illegal straw purchase. 
Mr. President, this motion is urgent because my bill would increase that penalty on illegal straw purchases from a gross misdemeanor to a felony. Mr. President, this motion is urgent because I can't imagine what the woman who purchased those firearms illegally for the man who gunned down those first responders would have thought if she had known that prosecutors in Minnesota were actually going to come after her. Hennepin County Attorney Mike Freeman in 2015 said that as a gross misdemeanor, we don't go after straw purchases. Mr. President, my motion is urgent because my bill passed committee. My bill is ready to go today. My bill had unanimous bipartisan support. Mr. Bill, President, my bill is urgent because there are mothers that will never hug their sons again. There are wives that will never watch their spouse walk through that front door again. There are children that are growing up without their father, and we could have done something about this last year. Mr. President, I repeat, this motion is urgent because three men are dead. Mr. President, I repeat, this motion is urgent because three men were killed. Mr. President, I repeat, this motion is urgent because three heroes were murdered. And we have the ability to do something about it today. Not kick the can down the road, not play political games, but do something about it today. And I urge members to vote to have this discussion right now. Thank you. Members, I want to make sure that the last voice that is heard is the author of the motion. And she is the last voice. Uh, and I did give Senator Lass an opportunity to be heard, and I did also give Senator Marty an opportunity to be heard. So, uh, 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 Senator Lass, I know that you were trying to get our attention even before because it sounds like or it looks like you forgot something. So I'm going to allow it, but then I'm going back to Senator uh, uh, Coleman again because I do not like for us to do this because the last person that we should hear should always be the author of the motion. Senator Latz and then Senator Coleman again. Uh, Mr. President, thank you. And if Senator Coleman had restricted her follow-up comments to the procedural merits of the motion, I would not be standing again. Unfortunately, uh, she expanded this into a substantial policy discussion, um, which uh, is frankly uh, uh, inaccurate in some regards um, and uh, compels a response on the merits. There is absolutely no way that one can stand here today and draw an absolute causal line between the absence of the bill that Senator Coleman introduced last year and the horrible outcomes um, among her constituents where a shooter used the guns to kill our first responders. The difference between a gross misdemeanor and a felony penalty is important. But there is no way to determine whether or not that difference would have deterred the individual who engaged in a straw purchase. And there is no way to know uh, whether or not um, there would have been any separate prosecutions somewhere along the way. We know that there is a prosecution now that is going to be happening under existing law. But I was the author of the straw purchase laws that made it a gross misdemeanor at the suggestion of then Hennepin County Attorney Freeman. We passed the bill a long time ago. We don't know, in the absence of prosecution in the past, is an individual prosecutorial decision about whether or not there is the ability to prove and convict a defendant. So perhaps now is the time for the Judiciary Committee to take another look at the specific language in Senator Coleman's bill and in other bills that have been introduced intending to accomplish the same purpose and to evaluate whether or not that language is strong enough and effective enough to accomplish the desired end. But there is no value um, to having an ongoing policy debate here on the floor. Uh, there is no urgency now that is going to unwind the passage of time from the tragic events um, in the last month. All we can do is do our best to look forward and to move forward, and I propose to do that, whether or not Senator Coleman's bill is referred back to the Judiciary Committee. 
Members, we're going to the author. The last voice that we'll hear will be the author of the amendment. Oh, excuse me, the author of the motion. Well, because we opened up the door, thank you so very much, Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. President. This bill was already heard in judiciary last year. It already passed. There is no reason to send this to judiciary. It's already been vetted. We need this from a gross misdemeanor to a felony. And the purpose of the urgency is to prevent future cases. It's to prevent this type of thing from happening again. Thanks, Mr. President. Any other discussion before we go to the author? Because I want to make sure that I do this so no one can say that they were not heard. Anyone else? Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I would just like a roll call on this decision. There was a real roll call requested by Senator Marty, from my understanding. And a roll call was requested and a roll call was granted. Any other discussion before we go to the author of the motion? Senator Coleman, you're the last voice that we're going to hear before we uh, go forward and vote. Thank you, Mr. President. I feel I've said my piece. It is time to act. I don't believe we should wait. We've seen what happens when we wait on things like this, and I don't want to see it happen again, and I humbly request a green vote. The secretary would take the roll on the motion to withdraw. Members, please vote. Senator Jasinski, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Liskey votes aye. Senator Liskey votes aye. Senator Frentz, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. I report Senator Dedzik votes no. Senator Dedzik votes no. And I report Senator Port votes no. Senator Port votes no. All senators having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There have been 33 ayes and 34 noes. The uh, motion is not adopted. <laughs> Senator Restrom. Mr. President, uh, pursuant to Rule 5.1, I move that Senate File 4771 be withdrawn from the Committee of State and Local Government and Veterans given a second reading and placed on general orders. And I am the chief author of that bill. Members, just so that we're, we're clear, pursuant to Rule 5.1, Senator Westrom, chief author, moves that Senate file number 4771 be withdrawn from the Committee on State and Local Governments and Veterans, given a second reading and placed on general orders. The same rules apply as, we, uh, as uh, the Coleman motion. We need 34 votes in order for it to go forward. Uh, uh, pursuant to Rule 5.1. Senator Westrom, you want to speak to your motion? Mr. President, uh, members, uh, this bill would let the people of Minnesota vote on the changing of the flag, and it would delay the implementation pending that vote to May of 2025 instead of May of 2024. So this bill would give the voters who have spoke up in numbers by the hundreds and thousands with the interest to vote on changing the Minnesota flag and seal. It would allow them to have a referendum this fall, and if it passes, the new flag and the new emblem would, or seal would go into effect one year later. If it doesn't, then the Minnesota citizens would have had their voice heard and they could be a part of this decision that they feel very important, very, very strongly about uh, being able to have a say in changing the Minnesota flag. And so, members, I would urge us to bring this up now because May 11th, 2024 is less than two months away from us, and we have the duty to take action so the citizens can have their voice heard and vote on this important change in our state. 
Members, we're now going to discussion on the motion that's before us, and I'm going to look at a, a, a call on various members if you want to speak. And the last voice that you'll hear on this motion will be that of Senator Westrom. But for now, we're going to Senator Murphy. Uh, thank you, Mr. President and members. I would uh, urge a no vote on this motion and ask for a roll call, Mr. President. Roll call requested, roll call granted. Mr. President, um, this is uh, the purview of the Committee on State and Local Government and Veterans, uh, chaired by Senator Dietzik. Uh, we note that she is not present on the floor today to speak to this motion, but I understand in a message that I have received from her that she would prefer to keep this bill in her committee for its consideration there. And members, I would respectfully ask for a no vote. Thank you. Uh, Senator Grudenhagen. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I would urge a green vote in support of uh, Senator Westrom. You know, uh, I initiated, along with my county commissioners, McLeod County, a resolution voted unanimously to uh, oppose the, uh, the new flag and also to ask for a vote. And, you know, members, we all come from different counties, and I have a list here in front of me, which I won't go over, completely, but it's going to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars across this state for the co local counties to make this change. And the least we can do is allow them to have a voice on this, rather than just a small committee making that decision. So regardless how the vote uh, comes out here today, I would just urge the committee that has jurisdiction over this to allow the public to vote. You know, I have uh, Democrats, Independents, and Republicans in my district, and a lot of them have my email, whether they agree or disagree with me on a lot of issues. But I have had unanimous support across the board from all political backgrounds. They want their voice. Whether they support the new flag or they don't, it's a, it's a travesty not to give the public an opportunity when we're going to uh, cost the local property tax, uh, taxpayers tens of thousands of dollars to make a change that they had no voice in at all. So members, I would support Senator Westrom's motion, and again, regardless if the vote doesn't pass, I would urge the committee with jurisdiction to please let the public have a vote. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, on my list I have next is Senator Draskowski. If you're interested in being on the list, please let me know so I can put your name on the list because the last voice that we will hear on this motion will be that of the author. Senator Draskowski. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you for bringing the motion, Senator Westrom. Members, uh, you will recall it was nearly a year ago now we were here debating the state government, state and local government finance bill in this body and discussing one thing about this particular provision of the bill, Mr. President, and that was the question of whether or not the people of Minnesota would be able to have their voices heard on an issue as important to them as the meaning and the history of their state as represented in the state seal and the state flag. That was, that was the question before us. The resounding answer from the majority, Mr. President, was no. The people of Minnesota were told no. We are not going to hear your voice on this. Uh, Republicans stood up in unison on this and said, we want the people of Minnesota to be heard before, by their elected representatives. And the Democrats, Mr. President, said no. We actually were able to get one Democrat to vote with us on a motion to do that. Just one out of 34 voted with Republicans to put an amendment on the bill, and it went to the conference committee. The Democrat majority, Mr. President, in the conference committee said to the people of Minnesota, no, we're not going to hear your voice here. They stripped that provision out of the bill. The omnibus bill came back to this floor without the ability of the people of Minnesota to be heard through their elected representatives, the people of Minnesota were told, no, we don't want to hear from you. That's what they were told. Mr. President, I was fortunate enough to be appointed to the State Emblems Redesign Commission, the commission, Mr. President, that was outlined and called for in the bill to meet 
the commission was to meet beginning in August and didn't begin meeting, Mr. President, until September, a month late. Uh, and as a matter of fact, they only had three and a half months to consider this major question, Mr. President, before us that affects the, the citizens of Minnesota, their understanding and perception of their history and projection of what their history and meaning is going forward into the future in this great state. And they, three months, three and a half months, we met weekly, Mr. President, up until the deadline, which was the last day of December, upon which the report was issued. Now, Mr. President, there were members of the commission, 13 members were voting members of the commission. Four of us were legislators, non-voting members. So, Mr. President, 13 people out of the nearly 6 million people in the state of Minnesota, 13 people chose the design of the flag and seal that is set to go into effect if this legislature does not act is set to go into effect on May 11th of this year as the next flag and seal of the state of Minnesota. 13 people had their voice heard, but nearly 6 million people as, as we are heading down the road now will not. And Mr. President, during that process, the three and a half month process, members of the committee, including myself and others, and begged the commission to take input from the people of Minnesota. Mr. President, the input that we had in terms of hearing lasted less than an hour and a half. About 15 people in the state were listened to. Two of those people, actually two of the 15 or so people that were, that, that, uh, were heard in that were from the, from the country of England, from the United Kingdom, while nearly six million people uh, were not heard from, Mr. President. So again, the people's voice and its abil their ability to be listened to in that process was rejected by this very process. As a matter of fact, we asked for input from the people of Minnesota. Give us your input about the, the, the tentative designs that have been put forward. We received like 2,000 pieces of input from the people of Minnesota. The committee, the commission, Mr. President, disregarded that input. It was never cataloged. It was never uh, brought forward uh, before the commission when, when I and other members brought uh, some of those pieces forward, some ideas, they were soundly rejected by the commission in favor of the direction they were going. The people of Minnesota were not heard in that process, Mr. President. As a matter of fact, before us today, Mr. President, is the opportunity for the people of Minnesota to be heard. They have been clamoring to be heard on this issue that is significant to each and every one of them as it reflects on what they understand to be their history and will project the meaning of the state of Minnesota into the future. And we have the opportunity, members, if we change direction and finally listen to the people for them to be heard in this process. I encourage members to vote yes on the Westrom Amendment or Westrom Motion. And Mr. President, I do understand that a roll call has been asked for. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. I have no one else on my list. I want to make sure that I scan the body. Senator Kunis. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, members, I would encourage you and ask you to vote no on this, uh, this amendment that has been brought up. We hear that there was no voice or the voice of Minnesotans were not heard. We heard them. They had a lot of time. They had opportunity to join us at the commi commission's uh, meetings, to send us emails, to send us information. I, I just want to remind everybody of the thousands of submissions that came forward and the amount of time while we might have not been public facing the amount of time the committee and the members took reviewing all of the selections, all of the submissions, all of the comments, and um, you know, this is, this is the passage of an incredibly uh, historic event, 
And we did hear from Minnesotans. Not everybody is going to like everything that is done. Not everybody is going to uh, like the flag. But this is what has happened, and this is what came from a very sound discussion. No matter what has been said, it has been a sound discussion led by an incredible leader in the commission. The thing about this bill specifically is this request for a referendum is not available to us as our state constitution does not allow it. And right there is our answer. And so members, once again, we don't have a mechanism for a statewide referendum vote on policy questions. And the only thing that you can do is to amend the state constitution if you want that vote. So I would uh, encourage and ask everyone here to vote no on this. Members, I'm looking around. Senator Jaskowski. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, I wasn't going to speak again, Mr. President, but uh, members, we have heard a, a falsity before us. Uh, I challenge any member here to find one place in our Constitution. Find me one place that says this legislature doesn't have the authority to make law as it's prescribed to do in the state constitution by engaging the voters. Not one place in there prohibits us from doing that. We have not done it in our history. As a matter of fact, this body has uh, talked about it in the past, uh, has uh, contemplated the idea of putting an item on the ballot uh, for a statutory change, but it has not happened yet. As a matter of fact, members, it is ludicrous for us to believe that we have the authority and we give our 853 cities, our 333 school districts, and our 87 counties the ability to, to do referendums in their local elections, and we actually tell them they have to do them, Mr. President, and to believe we as a legislature don't have the authority to do the same thing that we give the authority to local units of government to do is outlandish, Mr. President. There is no place in our Constitution that prohibits us from uh, engaging the people and asking the people to weigh in to develop and determine the direction of our great state. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, I want to make sure there's no one else before we go to the author of the motion. Seeing none, we'll, next, we'll hear our final words from Senator Westrom, and then we will vote. Senator Westrom. Mr. President, uh, members, again, I urge your support of this motion to bring this important bill up for the citizens of Minnesota so we can first debate it on the floor and then get it passed and delay the implementation by just one year of the new flag if that's the direction Minnesotans want to go. The reason it's important is this new flag and the new seal are being pushed through so fast it caught most Minnesotans by surprise coming into December and January. And they keep asking me on the street. At coffee last weekend, it was the topic of discussion what is being done to stop the push of the new flag and let us vote? And the people I talked to said, go back and make sure they know we want to vote on this. We don't want to just adopt a new flag without having our vo voices heard. And that's what this motion will do today, allow this to come right before us here in the Senate there's no need to rush this through because the path that's been put on by the Democrats is less than 12 months from passing the commission's authority to write up a new flag and seal, and it gave away the legislature's authority to stop it if it's not what we want. We actually have to take action as a legislature to stop it based on how they wrote the rules or the statute last year. That is seldom done around here. Most of the time we set up commissions and task forces to study, come up with proposals, and bring them to the legislature for us to ratify. 
This was done the opposite way, and it said, only if the legislature says stop, otherwise it will go into, a, into effect on May 11, 2024. And that's why it's important to support this motion today. Let's pause this rush to change the flag and erase Minnesota's history. It will erase the history of our Native American history in Minnesota from being on the flag. It will erase the farmer and the agriculture that's so important to our state that's on the flag. It'll erase the outdoors and the hunting and the Second Amendment that's such a big part of our state's history and culture. And members, let's let the people vote on this change. There is no rush to get the new flag into effect and certainly not a rush if the voters say no. But if the voters say yes, it will be implemented in May of 2025 instead of May 11th, 2024, which is the path the Democrats have it on right now, ignoring the citizens' right to vote. And so that's why I'm asking you to support this motion. Let's bring it up in front of the Senate now and start listening to the citizens, giving them the right to vote on a referendum this fall, and implement it a year later if that's what the citizens want to choose. I urge your yes vote. Members, thank you so much. The secretary will take the roll on the motion to withdraw. And remember, in order to prevail, they had, uh, uh, the motion has to receive 34 votes. Members, please vote. Senator French, for those voted under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. I report Senator Dedzik votes no. Senator Dedzik votes no. And I report Senator Port votes no. Senator Port votes no. Senator Jasinski, for those voted under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Liskey votes aye. Senator Liskey votes aye. All senators having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There have been 33 ayes and 34 noes. The motion to withdraw by Senator Westrom fails. Any other motions? Seeing none, sen uh, we will remain uh, under the, uh, excuse me, uh, Senate Resolution Number 84 will be referred to the Committee on Rules and Administration. There's no action that's required but I need to make sure that I made that uh, announcement. Remaining under orders of business of motions and resolutions, Senator Murphy to designate special orders. Thank you, Mr. President. Pursuant to Rule 26, I designate the following bill be made a special order for immediate consideration. Members, the list is on your desk. Members, a list is on your desk, and if you look at special orders, we will start at uh, General Orders Number 35, which is House File 4518, Senator Kunish, which is the Education Forecast Adjustment uh, appropriation bill. Thank you, Mr. President and members. Uh, this is an extremely simple, purely technical um, bill that adjusts the 2023 appropriations in education to ref reflect the per pupil forecast, um, the, the per pupil student counts from the February forecast. This appropriation amounts for um, forecasted Pro, uh, programs like the basic education formula, those were outdated by the last, uh, uh, outdated by the next economic forecast, and because our per pupil counts and actual programs costs have changed relative to the February forecast, it's necessary to adjust the forecast appropriations to the February forecast amount. 
So this bill adjusts the 2023 enacted appropriations to match February forecasts and adjust various aid amounts to reflect those per pupil students. It's very important that we pass this and get the, the dollars and the cents to our students. And so members, I would encourage everyone a green vote. Any other discussion on House File 4518? Senator Eric. Thank you, Mr. President. And members, this is an important bill to take care of our schools, uh, to fund them at the levels that we um, mandated upon them on the things that they have to do. And through the formula, uh, this gets that there. Um, this bill is here because we did not get the numbers correct, and so we're actually appropriating another $241 million. Again, this is good for our schools. But Mr. President, I think there are some other things that we can do that would be good for our schools, such as allowing them some flexibility. And Mr. President, I have an A1 amendment that would allow our schools some flexibility. Senator Eric offers the A1 amendment. The Secretary will report the A1 amendment Senator Rarick moves to amend House File Number 4518 as follows, page 12 after line 14, insert. This is the A1 amendment. Senator Rarick to the A1 amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, the A1 amendment is the language of my bill, uh, Senate File 5025. What this would do for our schools is when we look at everything that was put in front of them through last year's legislation, so many of them are overwhelmed by all of the things they have to do, from curriculum standards to disciplinary standards. This bill would allow school districts, through a vote of the school board, to delay any of the mandates that they choose that came through the education bill last year by up to three years. And it would also allow them to redirect funding that was appropriated from last year to areas of their need. That is very important. We've heard from so many school districts, they wanted new funding because they have so many needs, but they've asked over and over, do not tie strings with that. Do not mandate how we are to spend that money, or do not put new requirements on that are going to eat this new funding up. This bill does not repeal any of the mandates or any of the provisions that were passed last year, but it gives our school districts that ability to delay the ones that they, on the public record, vote to delay so that they have the time to implement them in the best way possible and the correct way. I would use one example that uh, people would probably look at, the READ Act that we passed. Every school district that I have spoken to is so happy that we have done that. And it is very good. Their concern is, is the time frame in which they've been given to get all the training done. This bill wouldn't allow them to stop training teachers, but it would allow them to delay up to one, two, maybe even three years if they feel that's what they need in order to get all of their teachers trained in a way that they can afford because they either have to hire substitute teachers if they're going to do in-service training or ask teachers to volunteer time or pay them overtime in order to get that training. And some small school districts don't have that flexibility. We also know that many small school districts just don't have the administration staff to understand everything that has come at them from last year and they don't have the time to implement all of those new things. This allows them to find, here, we can do this, but let's delay these other things so that we can address them next year, the year after. Uh, again, not asking to repeal anything that we did last year, just giving our schools flexibility to say, we can't make this one happen in the time frame that's been given to us. Let's delay it and give ourselves another year, two, or three to make it happen. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, uh, we will now go to Sen Senator Abler, uh, who is going to speak, and then I'm going to go to Senator Klein, and then I'll see if there's anyone else on my list before I come back to Senator Rarick, who is the author of the A1 Amendment, and he will have the last word if no one else wants to speak. Senator Abler. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Um, <clears throat> I've been around long enough. Um, growing up in uh, Anoka schools, that there, there was this entity called a school board, 
And they were elected, and uh, John Weaver was an early uh, school board member, and I remember they made decisions there that actually impacted uh, the teaching that goes on in uh, Anoka schools. And actually, Anoka has uh, been a leader in a lot of ways over those years, actually due to that ability of school boards to actually uh, make decisions. And uh, so I remember as I was running the first time, I was going to attempt to uh, fight the temptation to be one of the geniuses in St. Paul who knew better than people, than the other three million people of this state to, uh, to run their lives. And I, maybe I've done pretty good at that. I, was, I could always do better, I suppose. But, you know, education is not a political situation, Mr. President. At least it shouldn't be. This is all about every child succeeding. Over 800,000 students rely on our public system to, uh, to succeed. And, you know, there was a lot of excitement last session as we spent $6 billion, a record amount of money, on education. At one point, it was even touted by the governor that this is going to fully fund education. And I was, like, thinking that's a lot of money, but okay, if you can, you can find it and uh, spend it well, then maybe that's all right. I even voted for the bill off the floor, hoping I could support it coming back, and sadly, I could not because it um, had actually too much St. Paul in it, Mr. President. Um, and what that means is the locals, we don't get, they don't get to decide much of anything anymore. Uh, we tell them what to teach, how to teach, um, and, and, and actually uh, tie their hands in many ways. And, and so whereas many districts were looking forward to this great windfall of money, uh, teachers and parents and students alike and school board members, uh, it turns out that it didn't work out quite that way. Um, in fact, my district, because of some of these very mandates that they don't get to decide about, that they have to do instead of doing special ed or, or reading or math training or uh, working on absenteeism or controlling violence uh, that they're worried about in the schools, student on student in particular or student on teacher, they have to meet these requirements. And my district is poised to cut $25 million or more, Mr. President. Minneapolis district is poised to cut $100 million. Uh, with this record-breaking money, and it, it seems like maybe we should let the locals decide how they want to do their business. I think Anoka District would be a great case in point about how they're going to handle this. Uh, there were some elections, and, you know, that's not strictly sides, but Anoka is kind of divided three to three um, in how people might characterize it. And so for them to not do one of these mandates, it would have to make sense to the majority of that board. And I think there'd be some great discussions and maybe even a learning opportunity for the state. And so, Mr. President, is $317 million a lot of money. I guess I can't ask you to yield, but you could nod and go like, that's a lot of money. At least it used to be. Well, that's how much the local districts and the metro area have to reduce spending. And even Bowabic and... Glencoe and those little districts are going to have to reduce spending because of some of the very mandates that were passed. And so, Mr. President, um, if you believe that we want our kids to succeed, if you believe that reading and math is subpar at 50% of the third graders being able to read and do math at grade level, if we're not happy with that, if we're not happy with even that carrying forward into the higher grades and worried about the future, what if we let the school districts run the schools? What if we let the parents weigh in? What if the teachers could weigh in locally? Uh, Mr. President, I totally support this amendment, and I think this will truly make a difference today. And so then this could go forward. They could plan. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Klein. Mr. President, I request a roll call. Roll call requested. Roll call granted. Senator Kunish. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, the most important thing to know about this amendment, other than to vote no, is that um, it not, this amendment would not only delay implementation of the 2023 Education Finance Omnibus Bill by three years, it would delay payments to our school districts. Our school districts that need those funds after years and years of lack of funding to the schools. Finally, we found those dollars to get to them. This forecast article must be passed today to support our local school districts. I don't know how anybody can go back to their district and with their head held high after um, voting this, uh, for this amendment. 
Postponing last year's omnibus bill has nothing to do with paying schools for school for any of the projects that uh, that uh, the members have spoken about. This is about making sure that they have the dollars to continue the work that they are doing, continue to make plans for the next year, and continue to do the best that they can for our students in our community. So, members, I, vo I uh, request that you vote no. Members, any other, uh, other members before we go to the author of the amendment? I do see Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President. I apologize in advance. I'm not feeling very well. But the remark was just made by the chair of the Ed Finance Committee. How can anybody hold their head high and go back? Mr. President, the Democrat trifecta bill passed last year is filled with unfunded mandates. It is crushing many schools across this state. I have heard from my superintendents in my communities and from school board members that the amount of mandates that have been placed on them by the Democrat trifecta far exceed any new dollars that were given to them. There are districts in my area and in areas across the state that were already on the brink, already being challenged. And the Democrat trifecta bill passed last year pushed them even further into the red, further increasing the hardship, further denying opportunities for the students in our areas. And that's the travesty. That is why I, Mr. President, am urging a green vote on the RERIC amendment, because we need to hold our head high with truth. We need to hold our head high and provide those educational opportunities for students across the state. Not further mandates, not further usurping school board members in our local communities who are best in the position to make the wisest decisions, not having them usurped by unfunded mandates by this legislature and the Democrat trifecta. Thank you. We will now go to, on my list, Senator Nelson, and then I'll look to see if there's anyone else after Senator Nelson before I go to Senator Rarick. Senator Nelson. Well, thank you, Mr. President. I had not planned to speak today, but I think it's important uh, to set the record straight. Uh, there is, well, first of all, we do these forecast adjustment bills. Uh, on a regular basis when it comes to education. Uh, nothing unusual there. But I do want to be very clear that the dates in this are for fund transfers uh, fiscal years 25, 26, and 27. Those will start on uh, July 1. They're not here yet. Uh, and to say that, uh, and I want to make sure that the public is well aware of what uh, this uh, amendment would do. This, this um, amendment simply gives our local school districts a little bit of breathing room, a little bit of breathing room to determine. Some people think they should always have the right to determine which mandates they must uh, enact and must pass and must fund for their school districts. But in this case, it's nothing like that. It just allows a three-year window for schools to uh, get themselves uh, right righted with budgets, even with the historic funding passed, passed last year. Every school district in my Senate district, from very small to very large, are having significant financial challenges because of the unfunded mandates and the number of them that were passed last year. We should allow local school districts, by resolution, to pass an ability to determine which, if any, or all, of those unfunded mandates can wait until the next biennium until 2027 to enact. The alternative to that is laying off teachers. In fact, my school district sent me a spreadsheet that showed them the exact number of teachers that these unfunded mandates that we're trying to give them the relief for would cost them. So let's be clear what this is about, members. 
It is not about delaying funds. No, this is about giving school districts the authority by resolution to offer a brief relief from the mandates that were passed last year, those unfunded mandates. So I encourage a green vote. Members, any other members before I go to Senator Rarick, who will be the last voice we hear on the A1 amendment before we vote? Seeing none, Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and I appreciate the discussion on the amendment. Um, I agree um, with Senator Nelson that I do not see um, how it can be interpreted that this amendment would delay funding for our schools. What this amendment does is it gives our schools breathing room. Not every school has the administrative staff to comb through the bills that we pass here. Not every school district has the administrative staff to accomplish everything that's being required of them year in and year out. This is allowing those schools to look at what, what is their ability to work through and incorporate what this legislature did last year, allowing them up to three years to implement what was mandated upon them last year. Mr. President, I do not see how this would reduce their funding. What this does is it gives them flexibility with their funding to meet the needs that they have within their very school districts. And again, this isn't going to just happen. They have to take a recorded public vote so everyone is fully aware of what is happening. But in the conversations that I have had in the last five to six months uh, from superintendents, school boards, teachers, they are overwhelmed right now. And they do not know how they are going to incorporate and get everything accomplished that we have asked of them and actually required of them from last year's legislation. This is exactly what they are looking for and what they need. Please vote yes, Mr. President. Thank you. This is, the secretary will take the roll on the A1 Rarick Amendment. Members, please vote. Senator Friends, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. I report Senator Dedzik votes no. Senator Dedzik votes no. And I report Senator Port votes no. Senator Port votes no. Senator Jasinski, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Housley votes aye. Senator Housley votes aye. And thank you, Mr. President. Senator Liskey votes aye. Senator Liskey votes aye. All senators having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 33 ayes and 34 noes, the A1 amendment is not adopted. Members, anyone else before we go to third reading? The secretary will give the bill its third reading. House file number 4518, a bill for an act relating to education finance, making forecast adjustments. Members, this is third reading. If you want to speak, now is the time. If not, we will go to the author of the bill, and then we will go to, to vote for the final passage. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, we uh, heard this bill in finance, and... It's, it's a little bit disturbing when you hear about some of these numbers. Now, admittedly, every forecast is, or you know, every expectation is wrong and, and forecast is wrong and we make adjustments. But in this case, Mr. President, the adjustments are so far out of the realm of reality. The change just in the school lunch program and the school breakfast program that was passed, those fiscal notes were so far off that we are having to make a $136 million adjustment just in a nutrition program. Now, I'm sure somebody's going to claim that 
we're trying to repeal the nutrition program. That's not the case here. It's, it's law. It's in forecast. It needs to be accounted for. But when Senator Kunish stands up and says this bill has no fiscal impact, that's not true. Sure, it's included in the state forecast as it is supposed to be on a statutory basis. The forecast is supposed to reflect what the statutory requirements are, and this adjustment is needed, and therefore it's fairly non-controversial. But Mr. President, the people of Minnesota need to know that the true fiscal impact of this note is almost $250 million. I disagree with Senator Kunish when she says it has no fiscal impact. It has no forecast impact, but it does have a fiscal impact to the many, many families that are looking at our $1.5 billion structural deficit and wondering how we're going to make that up. Mr. President, how far off were these fiscal notes? The school breakfast fiscal note alone, we're having to make an 80 percent adjustment. Members, the finance, the, the, the Department of Education missed their forecast, and we have to increase spending by 80 percent in order to make up for their mistake. Now, I've done forecasting professionally for a long time, Mr. President, and I'll tell you that I have never seen a forecast that's been off by 80 percent. It makes me wonder if there was some political intervention along the way to keep the initial fiscal note down. The school lunch program is off 20 percent, one-fifth. Now, some of it is due to additional student counts, admittedly, but a lot of it was done because the Department of Education grossly underestimated the number of students that would be taking up free lunch. It's simple, Mr. President. You take the number of students times two, two meals, there's your cost. And if we come in a little high, then we're making an adjustment down and freeing up additional dollars for education to be used by local school boards, as Senator Rarick just tried to pass. But instead, Mr. President, we wanted this to look like an inexpensive program, and we wanted to cover up the fiscal mistake through the forecast. And I want the people of Minnesota to know what the true fiscal impact is, what the true monetary impact is, is almost a quarter of a billion dollars. Mr. President, we have a $1.5 billion structural deficit coming up in the next budget cycle. And almost 20 percent of that is tied to this missed forecast when we first passed this bill. This legislature needs to have confidence that the agencies are giving us accurate information when we pass our bills, and they're not. Time and time again, we've seen fiscal notes come through. The reason we're passing this bill today, Mr. President, is we're, our schools are about to run out of money. Normally, we would be doing this later on in session, but our schools are so desperate and need money. Prior Lake School District alone is going to be cutting $5 million this year, and if they don't pass an additional referendum, another $5 million next year. On record funding for education, so many mandates. We're having schools cut, as Senator Nelson said, cut teachers, cut programs, hurting kids. Mr. President, I'm going to urge members to vote for this bill, but the people of Minnesota need to know that this will have a fiscal impact. And so, Senator Kunish, I hope uh, that will be part of your closing remarks as well. Thank you. Members, we're on final passage of House File 4518. Anyone else before we go to the author for brief uh, final comments? Seeing no one else, Senator Kunish. Thank you, Mr. President. I would encourage everybody to vote green on this bill and get those dollars to the school so that they can continue to feed our students and educate them in the best way possible. Thank you. The secretary will take 
the roll for final passage of House File 4518. Members, please vote Senator French for those voted under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. I report Senator Dedzik votes aye. Senator Dedzik votes aye. And I report Senator Port votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. Senator Jasinski for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Housley votes aye. Senator Housley votes aye. All senators having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 51 ayes and 16 noes, the, the bill is passed and, the, and its title agreed to. <laughs> Members, we will now proceed to the 13th order of business. And there are no excuses. Anyone else with any announcements of Senate interest? Seeing none, Senator Murphy. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, hold on, hold on, Senator Murphy. I'm sorry. It looks, it looks like I missed someone. Blame it on my head and not my heart. Uh, Sen right. Senator Johnson. Thank you, Mr. President. It wasn't your fault. I stood up a little bit late. But I uh, just wanted to say we're going to have a brief caucus, Senate Republicans, uh, 323 upstairs following recess. Thank you. Thank you. A anyone else before we go to the Senate Majority Leader? Seeing none, Senator Murphy now. Thank you so much for your patience. Thank you, Mr. President and members. In a moment, I'm going to adjourn. Uh, but I want to remind everybody that it might snow. So watch your emails. All right. Mr. President, I move that the Senate do now adjourn until Monday, March 25th at 11 a.m. On that motion, all in favor say aye. All opposed say no. no. The motion prevails. The Senate is now adjourned. <laughs>